What Subaru was experiencing this episode wasn't just hell. If it was, then he would have been able to handle it no problem. I mean, he was always fine being the only one who had to suffer. But to see so many different flashbacks of so many different people going through such excruciating pain, well, that was something that went far beyond any hell that Subaru could have ever imagined. Each showed Subaru one of his unforgivable crimes. And in almost all of them, there was more to it than what we were shown in the anime. Whether it be more reactions from additional characters, or even a more detailed showcase of Reinhardt's powers, there is a little bit more that needs to be said. So, let's take a look at what we missed out from those as well as the additional stuff left out from the Witch's Tea Party. Let's begin. Episode 37, Witch's Tea Party, covering the last two chapters of Volume 12 of the Light Novel. As Subaru recalled the final moments of the previous loop, he couldn't even begin to imagine what was going through Amelia's mind as she went for the kiss, nor did he even want to. But despite how messed up the situation was, Subaru didn't regret that that was the last thing he felt. Her lips served as a grave reminder as to what happens when he isn't around to support her. Sure, that last loop may have had the best start by far, but if it meant leading to Amelia's mental breakdown then Subaru wanted no part of it. So, before waking up Amelia, Subaru first resolved himself yet again to be the only one to suffer to achieve his goal. To him it didn't matter how many hells he had to go through. So long as there existed a future worth grasping, then everything would be worth it. A very ironic statement considering the events yet to come. Now, as Subaru tried to make sense out of Roswell's actions, he came to notice that his motivations weren't that far off from that of the Witch's Cult. I mean, both tried to obey the words of the Tome as best they could, but the methodology in which they did so differed completely. For the Witch's Cult, Betelgeuse only had incomplete prophecies to work with. So, much of his plans were conducted on the spot with only vague descriptions to serve as the foundation. Roswell, on the other hand, had every single one of his actions dictated by the tome. His schemes within Sanctuary and even his death to the rabbits were all because that's what the book told him to do. Subaru also believed that forcing him to return by death was something that the tome had dictated as well. So, if Roswell's book was telling him to end the world or force Subaru into a situation where he had no choice but to die, then that made Roswell a far greater threat than Betelgeuse ever was. It also meant that he too was at the mercy of the tome. Subaru knew that there was nothing he could do to stop Roswell if his goals ended up straying from the path that the book desired. He knew it would almost certainly always lead to a restart. But despite knowing how futile his efforts would be, Subaru still resolved himself to find an answer that defied even this magic tome. So that's why he sought out the help of Echidna. If anyone was going to be able to help him find an answer, then it would definitely be her. But remember, getting invited back to her domain for a third time required a desire for knowledge far greater than ever before. He needed to yearn for an answer more than how he did when he lost his mind. The problem with that though was replicating a situation in which that was possible. To imitate a madness that stemmed from having his flesh being eaten away wasn't something very easily doable. It was much easier just to drop him right into the second trial. But as we'll find out later, this wasn't something that Echidna had planned for. Bringing us now to Subaru's unknowable present. To give more context as to what exactly this was, Subaru's consciousness had essentially been removed from his body. He was put into a state of confusion similar to when his mind shifts from present back to past. But this time the only thing that remained of himself was his consciousness alone. At first, the experience of being this non-material existence brought with it a feeling of fear. I mean, suddenly having no arms, legs, or body really took the concept of phantom limbs to a whole new level. It was only after Subaru remembered the concept of a deep breath that he was able to calm himself. Once he did, he found that all that remained of his material self was his sense of vision, followed shortly after by his sense of sound, both of which brought forth the very first disturbing flashback. If you remember from my very first cut content, this death didn't actually take place outside in the courtyard. Instead, Subaru had taken the knife from Rem's bedside and killed himself right there. So this whole scene should have been inside the room that Rem was being kept in. Because it wasn't, it resulted in a few alterations that needed to be made, mainly with regards to a little bit of extra stuff omitted from the end. But before we get to that, let's first start from the beginning. <laughs> As Subaru's consciousness started to make out the sounds and vision of Amelia crying over his betrayal, 
he found himself to be confronted by what he feared the most, the aftermath of his failure. Now, if I'm being honest, this whole scene actually felt a little bit rushed to me, much to the point that it made it lose a lot of the impact that I initially thought it was going to have. One of the reasons for this was that Wilhelm was much more emotional than what we saw in the anime. The other was that this was supposed to be one of many firsts for Subaru. It was the first time that he'd ever seen himself in such a state. It was also the first time that he'd ever seen Amelia grieve for him. But most importantly, it was the first time that he'd ever given thought to what happened after his death. This wasn't something he was ever supposed to think about. The worlds he left behind were never supposed to mean anything. All they ever should have been were midway points to the future that he desired. And the reason for that was actually very simple. To think about it any other way would destroy Subaru's entire world. It would invalidate his entire way of thinking. That's why he wanted nothing more than for the vision in front of him to stop. But since he was only a consciousness, he could neither turn his head away nor close his eyes. He was stuck seeing the results of his own failure all the way to the end. When Wilhelm rushed into the room after hearing Amelia's cries, his immediate loss of composure made Subaru even more distraught than he already was. It was the fact that someone like the Sword Devil had an expression of sheer dread on his face that shook Subaru to his very core. Wilhelm even had to take a few moments before finally realizing exactly what it was he was looking at, at which point he covered the wound and began to press Subaru's chest in an attempt to keep his heart beating. When Felix had stopped the healing magic, Wilhelm immediately began to question why. He still believed that there was more that Felix could be doing. But really he just hadn't yet realized that Subaru was already gone. Or rather, he didn't want to. So Felix had to make it clear that Subaru's soul was no longer there. It was a statement that made Wilhelm have an outburst of rage. He clenched his fist out of regret then proceeded to slam it straight into the floor. Splitting not only the wooden floorboards but also his fist as well. Now with a bloodied fist, Wilhelm could only look up towards the ceiling as he lamented over the loss of a dear friend. Felix on the other hand bore more a feeling of disgust as he could only interpret Subaru's actions as selfish. That was Subaru's crime. Although it was hard to make sense of the situation, the one thing that was made perfectly clear was that he had made a significant impact on all their lives. It was something he always failed to consider whenever he chose to leave them behind. Upon returning back to the tomb, we saw that Subaru began to speculate that this was part of the second trial. If that was in fact what this was, then Subaru was beyond terrified of having to face it. Yeah, sure, he had committed himself to facing Hal numerous times over. But Subaru found that facing this unknowable present was something far more terrifying than Hal itself. He was no longer confident that he'd be able to put himself through all the scenes of what comes after his death. I mean, how could he? This was, after all, the very thing that he feared the most. In the next scene of what lay beyond hell, as Subaru's consciousness bore witness to his second crime, Wilhelm had made an appearance shortly after Amelia. His body was covered with wounds after having fought many of the witch cultists, but that didn't stop him from inching his way closer to Subaru's body. As he did, he began to apologize to Subaru for not being able to save him. It wouldn't be wrong to assume that Wilhelm felt personally responsible for the loss of life in front of him. In fact, Wilhelm actually seemed to be even more impacted by this than how he was in the previous flashback. Both him and several of his companions began to shed tears. They were helpless to do anything but silently bear witness to the fate of the person who had brought them salvation. Every single one of them was a person that Subaru had fought beside, and each had made a promise to return to the capital together in victory. But now all they could do was weep over the fact that that was no longer possible. Subaru was in awe over the extent to which all these soldiers were affected by his death. But what brought the most anguish was the fact that this was a world where his devotion was never explained. Amelia would never be able to find out why Subaru had done so much to help her. It was a world in which his own weakness led to all sorts of things being left unfinished. That was his crime. When Subaru returned back to the tomb, his attempts to evade reality led him to roll around in a panic. He didn't want to have to face the crimes that birthed from his own weakness anymore. So he crashed himself into the sides of the tomb all while his head scraped the ground and began to bleed. It wasn't the pain of the impact that made tears start to flow down his face though. It was instead the idea that there were worlds that continued after his death. The very idea of this even being a possibility was enough to shatter the foundation with which Subaru had used to fight. 
Up until now, he'd always thought that it was him being left behind by everyone else. But now he was starting to think that maybe it was actually everyone else being left behind by him. Subaru wasn't so sure anymore. After the flashback with Ram and Beatrice, we then get to a lengthier one with Reinhardt, one that I'm sure that many of you weren't expecting. But in it was quite a bit of important information, stuff that gives more context to Puck's potential involvement with everything. So, starting from the beginning, the massive forest that once surrounded the Roswell Mansion was now nothing more than soil. Puck had completely leveled the entire area, not just with his massive body, but also with raging winds that were now strong enough to knock over entire trees. When Reinhardt made his appearance, there were a couple of interesting things to note from the lines that ended up being emitted from the anime. Before talking about Amelia, Puck first spoke of how he knew that this would be the outcome. He went to imply that this was something he already knew was going to happen, which already is pretty intriguing all on its own. But then Puck goes on to say something even more revealing, something that I think the anime decided to leave out on purpose and save for later. So if you don't want to know what it is, then feel free to skip ahead to the following timestamp. Anyway, what Puck says is that he also knew that Reinhardt would come and try to stop him, followed by the statement that Amelia could not be saved unless he froze the world, which if I had to guess was pretty much Puck's way of saying that he needed to force Subaru to return by death. It's the only thing that makes sense out of his statement regarding this being the only way to save Amelia. In any case, Puck's actions was something that Reinhardt simply couldn't forgive. They didn't fall in line with his standards of justice, and justice was the single thing that Reinhardt stood for. So he was left with no choice but to pull out his dragon sword, a legendary weapon left behind by the divine dragon from over 400 years ago. It was a sword that existed only to right that which was wrong. Now, because Reinhardt already knew how the battle would end, he made a promise that if Puck didn't move then he wouldn't make him suffer. He was absolutely confident that he wouldn't lose this battle. So, out of pure courtesy, Reinhardt offered Puck a painless death. But that was a deal that Puck couldn't accept. It was for the sake of his vow that Puck felt he had to use every bit of life he had left to fulfill his goal. If he was to just roll over and die, then that would be the same thing as turning his back on his contract. So, Puck's only option was to fight till the bitter end. An end that was immediately met by a single slash of the dragon blade. As mana circled all around Reinhardt's attack, not only did the slash work to slay the great spirit in front of him, but it also reverted the area around him back to its original state. The snow that once blocked out the air was now gone. The ground that had only recently been flattened had now begun to sprout up flowers. The way Subaru saw it, Reinhardt's single attack had both ended the world and simultaneously brought about its recreation. It was as if no battle had even taken place. Not a single trace of Pucker his destruction was left to be found. The last thing that Subaru heard as this scene came to an end was that Lady Felt would surely be sad. It was a final whisper before Subaru went on to behold eight more unknowable presents. By the end, he could no longer tell if he was back in reality or still in those nightmares. Although that's what he wanted to refer to them as, he wasn't even sure if that would be correct. To call them a nightmare would be to assume that they weren't real. But Subaru could no longer simply dismiss those visions as hallucinations. Instead, he wondered if they were perhaps genuine realities of what was hell beyond hell. He did consider the possibility of them being worlds created from his memories, but that wouldn't explain all the moments in which people were talking about stuff that he obviously didn't know before. It was for that reason that he couldn't fully deny their existence. As Subaru was having what was pretty much an existential crisis, all it took was a single sentence from the one he cherished most to bring him back to reality. A single smile from her face was enough to stare Subaru away from the dead end that he was rapidly approaching. But even then that still wasn't enough to release him from the guilt of his supposed crimes. That's why he began to lay everything out to the person standing in front of him. He wanted that person to pass judgement over both him and the crimes he'd been committing. He wanted to be scolded and receive a punishment equivalent to that of the weakness that had caused so many others so much pain. But that punishment never came. Instead, Subaru was met with a gentle forgiveness that he felt unbefitting to receive. A forgiveness that, as we saw, implored him to give up. This was the one and only weakness that Rem would never allow, leading Subaru to expose Carmilla for who she was. Now, Subaru's sudden outburst of rage made Carmilla think that he was going to start hitting her. So she began to plead with him so that he wouldn't. Of course, Subaru was never actually going to do that, 
but there was no hiding the anger he felt towards this witch for the sly trick that she had just tried to pull. What pissed Subaru off even more though was the timid demeanor that Carmilla seemed to have. Everything from the way she spoke to the way that she carried herself seemed to irritate him more and more. The more angry Subaru got, the more excuses that Carmilla seemed to make. She was saying how it was Echidna's fault for making her do it, then talked about how everyone was always bullying her. But that certainly wasn't what Subaru wanted to hear. His anger and frustration grew as he genuinely began to consider trying to make the switch shut up by force. He just didn't want to listen to anything she had to say anymore. This was about the time that Echidna decided to make her appearance. But unlike how in the anime Subaru simply dismissed the fact that he'd been played with, the Subaru in the novels wasn't so willing to let it go. He refused to sit down and talk until an apology or explanation for Carmilla's actions were given. It was the least she could do after having essentially violated what was one of Subaru's own personal sanctuaries. Despite knowing the importance of the conversation he wanted to have, Carmilla's actions simply weren't something that Subaru could forgive without an apology. So if Echidna was in fact the person who put her up to it, then she was the one who needed to meet his demands. It was an ultimatum that Echidna didn't seem to take all too kindly. But she knew that they would get nowhere without her saying at least something. So rather than apologize, she instead began to pin all the blame on Carmilla, stating that everything Carmilla did was out of her own desire to do so. Going on about how Carmilla went ahead and used the trial as an excuse to play with Subaru's emotions. This was the answer that Subaru was hoping for. He didn't want to have to bear any resentment towards Echidna. But even though this was the answer that Echidna gave, it still wasn't the truth. She pretty much went on to undermine the entire thing right after saying it, asking Subaru if he was satisfied now that he'd heard the words that he wanted to hear. You see, she knew that he was already well aware of the truth. Subaru just didn't want to accept it. He didn't want to believe that Echidna would do something so cruel. It's not like Echidna didn't regret having to resort to such methods though. It just wasn't something she felt the need to apologize for. I mean, if she hadn't done what she did, then the trial that Subaru was accidentally thrown into would have worn him down to nothing. This was the conclusion that she came to after having watched Subaru go through countless iterations of trials she personally designed. It also brought forth a significant contradiction. Remember, Echidna herself once said that she never gets involved with the results of a trial. If someone was going to fail, then failure was one of the results that she wanted to know. So Subaru was wondering why she changed her mind. Well, Echidna wasn't so heartless as to not regret the result of letting Subaru's mind break. It was because of this that she did what she thought was best to prevent that. This answer slowly went to disperse all the anger and rage that Subaru had accumulated. There was no denying the fact that Echidna had just saved him. It's not like he was going to thank her for it, but he also wasn't going to hold a grudge against her either. Instead, the two just proceeded to have their tea party. Their initial conversation of the trial brought forth a bit more on Subaru's authority. Yes, the realities Subaru saw were nothing more than fictitious constructs, but Echidna couldn't confirm the principles under which Return by Death functioned. For all she knew, Subaru could very well have been shifting to parallel worlds after every death, perhaps even overwriting an existence of himself that was from a world where he was still alive. There simply wasn't any way to confirm or deny that branching planes of realities actually existed. So to say that these worlds where Subaru had died didn't still exist, well, that wouldn't be correct. So Subaru wasn't able to annul himself of his crimes just yet. He wasn't even able to confirm that they actually existed. Instead, he was stuck forever considering the possibility of what could be. Echidna could see all the pain that these lingering thoughts of doubt brought with it. So her recommendation was to simply break with the past. Leave all the crimes he's committed behind him and focus only on moving forward. They were words that Subaru thought were intended to console him. But consolation was neither what Subaru needed nor wanted. He wasn't so shallow as to allow Echidna's words to make light of every sin he's ever committed. But even so, Echidna still continued to try to sway him, using her words to counter everything that Subaru would say. Subaru believed that no one could grant him forgiveness, but the Echidna that knows his past says that she can. Subaru felt that no one could judge his crimes for him, but the Echidna that bore witness to each and every single one of them says that she will. Subaru believed that no one could approve of him, but if Echidna couldn't approve of the Subaru that was right in front of her, then instead she would reject the Subaru that won't forgive himself, 
she was relentlessly bombarding Subaru with words that tried to get him to resist. She wanted Subaru to cast aside his regrets so that he could keep pushing forward. The reason for which only became clear after Rikidina offered to make the pact. Now, for Minerva to interrupt a ceremony as sacred as the creation of a witch's pact, well, that was certainly no minor issue. Whatever scheme it was that Echidna was planning, it had gone to trigger Minerva's rage. So, with two witches now simultaneously appearing in front of Subaru, Echidna had no choice but to explain the true nature behind their coexistence. As we learned in the anime, substitution wasn't actually necessary, but there was a specific reason as to why she only let one witch out at a time. If Echidna's soul was to be left alone with the soul of any of the other witches, then that would put her own self in danger. There was always the risk that another witch would try to defeat her in an attempt to take control over her domain. Using Sekhmet as an example, she alone was powerful enough to defeat not only Echidna, but also the four other witches combined. So, to allow her to be present at the same time as Echidna was a risk to her very existence. Or, so she says. Echidna was speaking all these words as if giving Subaru the exact answer that he needed to hear. And Subaru was much too quick to accept these words without even giving them a second thought. So Minerva had no choice but to strike Subaru in the back of his head, giving him an impact that felt powerful enough to rip it straight off. Instead though, it revitalized his entire body and mind, allowing Subaru to fully comprehend what it was that she was trying to get him to see. Specifically the parts about how Echidna's pact wasn't all that good for him. You see, Minerva knew quite a bit about how Echidna tends to treat her pacts, as the witch who's interfered the most in history and made the most contact with humans, Echidna had numerous examples in which her pacts didn't end in happiness. So Minerva wanted to prevent Subaru from falling into that same situation. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with Echidna wanting to tag along with Subaru on his path to the future. Her initial explanation of the compensation actually had Subaru ready to dismiss Minerva's warning. But Carmilla's words went to add to that extra layer of doubt. The thing is, she wasn't interfering because she wanted to help out Subaru. Carmilla just wanted to get back at Echidna for having deceived her. She was the type of witch that found it absolutely unforgivable when people betray her trust. In fact, her words were spoken with so much disdain that if Subaru hadn't been looking at Carmilla's face, then he wouldn't have known that it was her that was talking. It was also clear from the look in her eyes that she now bore a significant hatred towards Echidna. A hatred that even Echidna began to regret as having become the outcome of her little play. In any case, Subaru wasn't just sitting there listening to these two bicker. He inserted himself back into the conversation to demand that Carmilla explain exactly what it was that Echidna was hiding. If she didn't, then how would he ever be able to understand? Before that could happen, Echidna tried to assure him that doubting her now would do him no good. But that's when yet another witch entered the picture to become the mediator. Unlike the other witches, Sekhmet wasn't there to give Subaru a warning. She was simply there to ensure that no one resorted to force to get their way. If they did, then Sekhmet said that she'd step in and kill them. That was the purpose of her existence. That being said, to maintain the prospect of fairness, she did give Subaru the clue that allowed him to understand the consequence of making a pact with Echidna. As the author himself summed it up, if Subaru had gone ahead and made the pact with Echidna, then she would have used his power to witness every route imaginable. She would make him go through every possibility first before finally pointing him to the optimal future that he desired. It was essentially the same thing as saying that she'd make Subaru die over 10,000 times, all for the purpose of gaining knowledge on any and everything that she possibly could. That was the essence of the lengthy speech that Echidna had given him. That being said, there's actually quite a bit more to it than what we were shown in the anime. I mean, it's quite literally a massive wall of text. No paragraphs, no new lines, just continuous sentences. It really is worth the read though. So I'll see if I can leave it in the comments or as an image in the description so that you can give it a read yourself. It'll make complete sense out of Akedena's true intentions. In any case, her words were all that it took for everything that existed between herself and Subaru to crumble into pieces. It was far too cruel a revelation to know that everything had been meticulously set up just so that it could lead to this moment right here. But the final nail in the coffin was the stuff about Beatrice. One thing that the anime didn't mention was that Beatrice's initial purpose wasn't to watch the archives. Echidna had created her with completely different intentions in mind, one that perhaps relates closer to Sanctuary than we may think. But yeah, that's pretty much everything you need to know about episode 37. 
So I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about the story. And if you did, then be sure to leave a like or comment. Also, feel free to subscribe so you can get the notification of when I post the episode for the finale. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!